the monster storm packing a punch to millions. Hundreds of flights canceled, highways ground to a halt as a severe threat sweeps across the country, bringing snow, damaging hail, and potential tornadoes. We'll bring you the latest details. Plus, the developing news as we come on the air involving Donald Trump's hush money payment and classified documents cases and what it could mean for his reelection bid. And we have no choice but to continue. And he was a like, never give up person. And uh, if he would stop now, it would be like a betrayal of his legacy. Alexei Navalny had been a symbolic hope among those in Russia who opposed Vladimir Putin. And now after his death on the eve of an election that could keep Putin in power for years, we take a look at how the ruler is stamping out any opposition while driving fear across Russia. Good evening, everyone. I'm Stephanie Ramos in for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We are following those stories and much more, including a shooting on the New York City subway that has left at least one person injured and commuters ducking for cover. Plus, the historic moment when the vice president visited an abortion clinic declaring a health crisis. The launch of the largest rocket ever made and the stunning images coming in from the big SpaceX mission today. And also a wild scene after a FedEx truck rolls over a bridge. What we're learning about those injured, including an infant. But we begin with a dangerous cross-country storm on the move tonight. A major snowstorm in Colorado, tornado watches from Texas to Ohio. And now this system is headed east. The system dumping up to three feet of snow and near hurricane strength winds in the mountains. Multiple ski areas shut down today. More than 800 flights canceled to and from the Denver airport. And Colorado could see up to a foot more of snow tonight. Dozens of cars and trucks were stuck in that heavy snow snow on I-70. You see the video there in Evergreen, Colorado. And on the warmer side of that front, the severe weather concern and tornado risk. Take a look at this massive tornado caught on camera in Alta Vista, Kansas. And it's going to be a long night ahead in the tornado zone and much of Colorado remains at a standstill. Ginger Z will have the forecast in just a moment. But first, Mola Lange leads us off from Denver. Tonight, vehicles sliding, stalling, and stranded from a massive weather system dumping feet of late season snow in the Rockies. This is a sight we've been seeing all day. Drivers spinning out, getting stuck, needing help from Colorado Department of Transportation folks, getting towed out, getting pushed, whatever it takes. Roads out here are treacherous and will only get worse before they get better. Outside Denver, multiple stretches of Interstate 70 shut down, the crucial highway turning into a travel nightmare. Tractor trailers spinning their wheels, drivers getting out to push their cars. Charlie Stubblefield and his team from Mountain Recovery trying to clear the interstate. We are stuck with three feet of snow probably. Look at the top of that semi right now. Uh, vehicles that have been stranded out here for a good 17 hours. Denver's public schools closed. More than 800 flights in and out of Denver's airport canceled. The extreme conditions forcing multiple ski resorts to close down. It's right there. See it? Yep. Meanwhile, in the heartland, a severe weather outbreak is unfolding. With 35 million Americans under threat from Texas to Ohio. A suspected tornado touching down in Milton, Kentucky this afternoon. Two people were hurt. We have multiple trees down, probably 50 to 100 houses that have some kind of damage. AccuWeather storm chasers catching this massive twister as it tore across farmland west of Topeka, Kansas overnight. Those storms dumping up to softball-sized hail. And Mola Lenghi joins us now. Mola, I imagine it'll be a long night ahead for those folks dealing with all the snow. Yeah, winter weather watch continues into Friday morning. Stephanie, uh, it is still snowing as we speak. As you can see by this down tree, there is still a lot to clean up throughout the area. And even once it stops snowing, travel and the roads are expected to remain dicey throughout the Denver metro area, Steph. All right, Mola Lange there in Denver for us. Thank you so much. Please stay safe. Now let's get to the forecast to see what happens next. ABC's chief meteorologist Ginger Z is timing it all out for us. Hey there, Ginger. 
Hey, Stephanie, so here we are. It was in the mid 70s ahead of all the storms in the middle of the nation. You know something is big when Denver and everyone's getting all that snow. So that big temperature gradient kicked off more tornadoes today and we've got tornado watches at this moment all the way from Toledo back to Texarkana and Dallas just got in a severe thunderstorm watch. That's going to be all the way through the overnight hours. We know that nocturnal tornadoes can be really dangerous. So watch that have two ways to get warnings if you're anywhere highlighted there. Then I want to take you to the snowy side of this because Denver and the surrounding area not done yet. An additional six to 12 inches is possible and it'll be gusty winds coming along with that. Southern Rockies will get some too and we're going to break up this warm weather party with a few showers. Stephanie. Thanks for watching it all for us, Ginger. Donald Trump's hush money case in New York set to begin in just over a week now, but the Manhattan District Attorney is moving to delay it a month. It comes a day after the U.S. Attorney's Office turned over 31,000 pages of new documents. That would put all four criminal cases brought against Trump on hold with no certain start dates and comes as he appeared in court in Florida today. Here's ABC's senior investigative correspondent, Aaron Katursky. <laughs> Donald Trump arriving at a Florida court, his lawyers trying to convince a federal judge the special counsel's case over his handling of classified documents should be dismissed. Trump's team arguing the charges were unconstitutionally vague. But Judge Aileen Cannon, who Trump appointed to the bench, ruling tonight she will not dismiss the case on those grounds. She's still considering another motion to dismiss, but after a full day of arguments, Cannon strongly signaling she is inclined to let the case move forward, saying your arguments might have some force but it's difficult to see how this leads to a dismissal of the indictment. Are you prepared to go to trial on March 25th? Her ruling coming just hours after a surprise announcement in New York. The Manhattan District Attorney Alvin Bragg proposing a one-month delay on the start of Trump's hush money trial. Trump's accused of trying to conceal payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels. The first of the former president's criminal trials was supposed to get underway less than two weeks from now. Prosecutors said they just got their hands on tens of thousands of pages and documents from the Justice Department, and they want to give Trump's legal team up to 30 days to review them. Prosecutors noting there will be another production of documents by next week. Mr. Cohen, what did the committee want to know? The records you? are related to Trump's former fixer, Michael Cohen, who wrote the check to Stormy Daniels. Trump has pleaded not guilty, his legal team demanding months to go over the new records, which would delay the trial even more. Aaron Katursky joins us now. Aaron, tomorrow we're expecting a major decision in another case involving Trump, the one on election interference in Georgia. What are we expecting to hear? We're expecting to hear a ruling whether Fulton County District Attorney Fannie Willis should be disqualified from the case she brought against Trump. The judge is weighing whether her romantic relationship with another member of her prosecution team posed a financial conflict of interest. Whatever way that ruling goes, Stephanie, it is likely one side or the other might try to appeal it, potentially delaying that case too. Stephanie? A hearing that's taken weeks coming to a close. Aaron, thank you so much. Next tonight, Vice President Kamala Harris and the historic visit to a Planned Parenthood clinic in Minneapolis. The first time a president or vice president has been to a women's health clinic that offers abortion. The president, his campaign and Democrats are trying to keep the focus on the overturning of Roe. Rachel Scott reports. Tonight, Kamala Harris making history as the first vice president to visit a women's health clinic where abortions are provided a sign of just how central this issue has become to the Biden campaign. And walking through this clinic, that's what I saw, are people who have dedicated their lives to the profession of providing health care in a safe place that gives people dignity. And I think we should all want that for each other. 21 states have banned or restricted access to abortion since the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. The Minnesota Planned Parenthood Clinic Harris visited says they've seen a nearly 100% increase in patients coming in from other parts of the country. How dare these elected leaders believe they are in a better position to tell women what they need, to tell women what is in their best interest. We have to be a nation that trusts women. Democrats keenly aware voters have moved to protect abortion rights in all six states where it has appeared on the ballot since Roe versus Wade was overturned, including conservative states like Kansas, Kentucky, and Ohio. In his State of the Union speech, President Biden noting that in the Supreme Court's decision overturning Roe, the justices themselves wrote, women are not without political power. You're about to realize just how much you get right about 
The president is counting on abortion to drive voters to the polls this November. As many as 14 states could have measures related to abortion or reproductive rights on the ballot. Among them, Nevada, Pennsylvania and Arizona. Battleground states that could decide this election. Our thanks to senior congressional correspondent Rachel Scott. Horrific video shows the moments after a man was shot on the New York City subway. Riders were seen ducking for cover and could be heard screaming in horror just after the victim was shot in the head. It happened inside of a subway station in Brooklyn shortly before 5 p.m. The victim was seen on a stretcher being rushed to the hospital in critical condition. Police sources say a suspect is in custody and a weapon has been recovered. A rare rebuke of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu by the highest ranking Jewish official in the U.S. government. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer says Netanyahu is an obstacle to peace and called for elections to replace him. ABC's Matt Gutman is in Israel tonight. Tonight, that stunning rebuke from Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer calling for Israel to hold new elections because he believes Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu is an obstacle to peace. As a lifelong supporter of Israel, it has become clear to me the Netanyahu coalition no longer fits the needs of Israel after October 7th. In a 40-minute speech, Schumer, the highest-ranking Jewish official in the U.S., saying Israel has lost its way and demanded it do more to protect civilians in Gaza. Netanyahu's Likud party criticizing the speech, saying Israel's not a banana republic whose leader can be swapped out. The ramped-up rhetoric comes as the IDF prepares to launch a major military operation in the southern Gaza city of Rafah. The Israeli military now says it will evacuate 1.4 million displaced people there before it attacks. But with Gazans facing famine, the White House and Democrats under increasing pressure for a ceasefire and for increased aid into Gaza. Today at a border crossing not far from Rafah, we spoke to the Israeli commander responsible for allowing aid into Gaza, Israel blaming the UN for failing to distribute aid. Specifically, are you saying that there's no hunger or that there is no starvation in the north of Gaza? I'm because saying the UN is about to declare a famine. I'm saying that there is no starvation. There are challenges. There are challenges of accessibility also. And Matt Gutman joins us now from Jerusalem. Matt, what reactions have you heard there to Senator Schumer's comments? Uh, one thing that's clear, Stephanie, is that it's being talked about a lot. Um, the head of the opposition cheered it, said that this is the right move, and said that Netanyahu is not only not making friends with the U.S., they said he's trying to distance them on purpose for political gain here in Israel. However, and despite the fact that Netanyahu really is deeply unpopular in Israel right now, even some of his staunchest opponents said, listen, it should be Israeli citizens only who decide the prime minister. Stephanie. Mm, hopefully there is some result very, very soon. Matt Gutman for us there in Jerusalem. Thank you so much. The ongoing chaos in Haiti has become extremely tense as armed groups have banded together in an attempt to overthrow the government. Groups attacking and setting fire to the home of Haiti's National Police Director in Port-au-Prince. Haiti's Prime Minister has not returned to the country due to the violence. U.S. Marines were flown in earlier this week to rescue a group of employees from the U.S. Embassy. Joining us now from Port-au-Prince is Gary Kalikst, the Communications and Program Visibility Manager for the Community Organized Relief Effort in Haiti. Gary, thank you so much for speaking with us, especially under these circumstances. CORE, that organization formed in response uh, after the devastating earthquake in Haiti in 2010. Now you're dealing with another humanitarian crisis there. Tell us how your response has evolved. Thank you for having me. Um, the current situation in Haiti is alarming and that makes today humanitarian support being more difficult since World's Blog Airport is also blocked. It is now a day harder to reach people in difficult situation. And, and, and Gary, in such a difficult situation, you mentioned the airport is blocked and, and people are living in fear. How are you able to deliver food and aid while there is active violence? Um, CORE operates in Haiti in the West Department and also operates in the south of Haiti. Even if the crisis is emphasized more in the West Department, but it also affects the national economy because people living in countryside, such as the South, um, the Nymph Department, 
can come in Port au Prince to sell the merchandise. So that affect the situation, they also have food security needs. And core is actually warning a program, a food security program in the South Department, helping these people who are today not able to come in Port au Prince to sell the products. And also core has an education program Co on and operates a school in Port au Prince. And I can say supporting education is one of the most important aspects of supporting humanitarian needs in Haiti because today we have a lot of armed gangs and they are youth. And you mentioned education being one of the issues facing Haitians. What would you say are some of the most serious, immediate issues you see Haitians face facing right now? Um, one of the biggest issues that we're facing now in Haiti, it is about security. Because as I already mentioned, um, the population is living with stress due to rampant violence situation. Because you are not, uh, you can live with your ease wherever you are. <laughs> A jury in Michigan has reached a verdict in the case of James Crumley, the father of the Oxford High School shooter. Let's go to the courtroom of the trial and listen in. I will also be issuing an order that will obviously not uh, be uh, made public in the courthouse until uh, tomorrow morning. Um, in addition, case number 22279989 FH of the People versus James uh, James Crumley, the same thing. The order restricting. Uh, Pre-trial publicity was entered um, on July 14, 2022, and that order will also be set aside um, as of the reading of the verdict. Are you uh, ready for the jury? Yes, Your Honor. Yes, Your Honor. We are waiting to hear the verdict in the trial of Michigan father Jason Crumley charged in his son's deadly school attack. The jury deliberating tonight. We know that weeks ago, another jury finding his wife guilty of involuntary manslaughter. Again, we are awaiting the verdict in the Jason Crumley case, again, charged in his son's deadly school attack, that school in Michigan, Oxford High School. Let's pause and take a listen. Sure. Count one, involuntary manslaughter as to Madison Baldwin. Guilty of involuntary manslaughter as to Madison Baldwin. Count two, involuntary manslaughter as to Tate Mir. Guilty of involuntary manslaughter as to Tate Mir. Count three, involuntary manslaughter as to Hannah St. Juliana. Guilty of involuntary manslaughter as to Hannah St. Juliana. Count four, involuntary manslaughter as to Justin Schilling. Guilty of involuntary manslaughter as to Justin Schilling. Thank you, four person. Uh, I'm gonna ask that Ms. Williams pull the jury.
So she's going to ask you each. Jury in seat number one, was that and is that your verdict? Yes. Jury in seat number two, was that and is that your verdict? Yes. Jury in seat number three, was that and is that your verdict? Yes. Jury in seat number four, was that and is that your verdict? Yes. Jury in seat number six, was that and is that your verdict? Yes. Jury in seat number seven, was that and is that your verdict? Yes. Jury in seat number eight, was that and is that your verdict? Yes. Jury in seat number nine, was that and is that your verdict? Yes. Jury in seat number 11, was that and is that your verdict? Yes. Jury in seat number 12, was that and is that your verdict? Yes, it is. Jury in seat number 13, was that and is that your verdict? It is. Jury in seat number 14, was that and is that your verdict? It is. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. I know how hard this has been on all of you just by reading your face. Uh, I, I know this has been a very hard decision. Um, we appreciate your time. I'm going to ask you to return to the jury room, and I'll be there uh, there with you in a few minutes. All right? All rise for the jury. You heard it there. The trial of Michigan father Jason Crumley charged in his son's deadly school attack. The jury deliberating tonight and finding him guilty on all four counts of involuntary manslaughter. I want to bring in uh, Trevor Alt, who has been on this story for quite some time from the beginning. Trevor, what do you make of all of this? Was this expected? Well, it was a little bit difficult to imagine, Stephanie, that you would have only the mother found guilty in this case, but there were definitely some nuances with the fact that these trials were separate and there wasn't as much evidence introduced in the trial of James Crumbly as there was against his wife. In fact, I found it quite fascinating that this jury deliberated over the course of two days. They stayed past when court usually closes at 4.30 because they must have been close to reaching this verdict, but they deliberated for almost the exact same total amount of time as Jennifer Crumbly's verdict did, almost 11 hours. And even though the fact that this trial proceeded much faster than her trial did, only a matter of a few days while hers stretched almost two weeks, it's clear that this jury, just like the last one, found that ultimately James Crumbly was responsible, criminally responsible, by not stopping this shooting, by ignoring all of those warning signs of his son's deteriorating mental health, by buying him that weapon. And also my main takeaway, Stephanie, is that this is going to make an appeal much harder. James Crumbly, while his attorney did make uh, the same kinds of arguments that Jennifer Crumbly's attorney did, he took a different tack in that he decided not to take the stand in his own defense. Jennifer Crumbly, of course, did do that. A lot of people thought she was going to try to appear as a sympathetic mother, but afterwards felt she might have hurt her chances by testifying that looking back, she wouldn't do anything differently. The fact that James Crumbly doesn't take the stand in his own defense that some of the evidence that was used against her, text messages in which their son uh, texted his mother that he was seeing demons and spirits at home that she ignored. He followed up saying, please respond. Can you at least text back? She ignored that, too. That was used by prosecutors to prove that she was literally ignoring his cries for help. That evidence was not allowed against James Crumbly, and they still found this enough evidence can, to convict him on these four unprecedented counts of involuntary manslaughter. What this tells me is that we are now in a new day uh, in how America responds to mass shootings and school shootings, given the fact that now we have uh, these two parents, the first in American history, held criminally liable for their child's school shooting. Unprecedented indeed, as you mentioned, for, for the parents of a school shooter to be found guilty. We have not seen that before. Joining us now is University of Baltimore School of Law professor and ABC News legal contributor Kim Whaley. Kim, what do you make of this verdict, finding him guilty of involuntary manslaughter on all counts, not just him, his wife as well? Well, it's not really a surprise given that we saw the verdict with the wife. That was really the watershed moment. And it's a watershed moment for uh, families and parents when it comes to guns. I think what's interesting here is that Michigan amended its gun laws after this tragedy to now require that, uh, that there be some safety mechanisms by law in the home. So essentially what this verdict, both of these verdicts are saying is that the jury of these parents' peers are holding them accountable for 
for not essentially Im implementing at home what across the country in many states our legislatures are not willing to do. But I think with respect to, to Mr. Crum Crumbly here, the defense argument was he just didn't know. He didn't know his son was this dangerous. And um, I suspect the jurors saw through that. Um, that's not okay for a parent to have no idea that your child is on the verge of, of this kind of mass murder. And Kim, uh, Trevor touched on this. Uh, the Crumleys are the first parents to even be charged. What could this mean for future mass shooting cases? Well, you know, if legislatures don't step up and start protecting people by law, listen, I mean, I doubt these people would have put a 12-year-old behind the wheel of a car because we've got rules around uh, the age in which you can drive a car. If we had these kind of laws across the country, we might not see this kind of negligence and this kind of recklessness. But, I, but it does send a message that prosecutors might pick this up and start holding parents accountable um, for not just negligence, not just child neglect. That's We've seen that prior to here, but actually being responsible for the death, for manslaughter, as if they participated in the the events that led up to these four tragic deaths. That's a that's a real different uh, argument that these prosecutors managed to persuade these juries of than just not just, but you know, negligence, uh, aiding and abetting this kind of thing. Uh, parents are now going to have to to pay attention, and hopefully, as I said, legislators will pay attention and see, listen, people do want sensible laws or sensible restraints, disincentives, which is what this is, disincentives for treating guns like, like you know, it's, it's any other thing in your home and doesn't have the kind of deadly outcomes uh, that the statistics demonstrate. You're much more likely to have a death by suicide if you own a home or own a gun than you are to see uh, a gun used against an intruder to to save a life. Um, so maybe it'll wake uh, parents up, Americans up, to the fact that these are deadly weapons and they need to be handled with extreme care. Or you can see, I mean, these two parents are going to go to jail along with their son. Thanks so much, Kim. I, I want to go to Trevor uh, one last time. Trevor, uh, what's next for Jason Crumley and his wife? So now we head to the sentencing phase for both of them, Stephanie. And we know that Jennifer Crumley, having already been convicted, her sentencing had been put on hold for at least a little while. That's scheduled for next month. They're both now guilty on these four charges of involuntary manslaughter. Each of those counts carries a maximum of 15 years in prison. It's highly likely that those sentences would be served concurrently. So I, technically, there's a maximum of 60 years in prison for this couple. Uh, more likely, the maximum will be around 15, and they may not even serve that many. But you have to consider the fact that they've already spent more than two years in jail. Jennifer Crumbly testified that they had, the couple has not spoken to one another since the day they were arrested, in which they, uh, according to prosecutors, went on the run after the first charges were announced back in December of 2021. Uh, and I do want to note, as we talk about the fact that, you know, this is unprecedented, the first parents charge, this was, at, and uh, this is according to the prosecutor, very special circumstances, unique gross negligence, according to the prosecutors who first filed the charges. They were very clear that they weren't charging James and Jennifer Crumbly because they were just bad parents. They felt that this was so egregious, buying the weapon in the days before the shooting, getting called into the school the day of the shooting, declining to take him home even though he had drawn the gun that they had bought him, a person who was shot, he wrote blood everywhere, he wrote the thoughts won't stop, help me. In the days leading up to the shooting, he was caught in class searching ammunition on his phone. They called his mother. She laughed it off, texted him, I'm not mad, LOL, you have to learn not to get caught. The prosecutor said they were not trying to set a new precedent here where all parents are guilty if their child commits a crime. They were saying this was so egregious that it had to be criminal, and it turns out now two separate juries agree with them, Stephanie. They certainly do, and, and hopefully the families of those lost can find uh, some healing and justice in all of this. Trevor Alt for us reporting on this. Thank you so much for those updates, and uh, thank you to our legal contributor, Kim Whaley, as well. We still have much more to get to here on Prime, a wild scene after a FedEx truck rolls over a bridge. What we're learning about those injured, including an infant. But up next in our Prime Focus, following the death of Alexei Navalny, one of Vladimir Putin's most vocal critics, Russia's opposition is trying to figure out what to do next as Putin is poised to serve a fifth term. We have no choice but to continue and he was uh, 
like never give up person and uh if he would stop now it would be like a betrayal of his legacy whenever news breaks we are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In Rolling Fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland, let's go. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. Welcome back. Alexei Navalny's name was known around the world as the symbol of opposition to Vladimir Putin, the man that stood up to him and paid the ultimate price. And now as Russia holds elections that will likely keep Putin in power for years, Russia's opposition is fighting to survive and to adjust to life without Navalny. In tonight's Prime Focus, ABC's Patrick Rival reports on the men and women still fighting to keep the opposition alive despite the death of their own symbol as Putin nears a fifth term. <laughs> For days after Alexei Navalny's funeral in Moscow, thousands continued to bring flowers. Coming to honor Russia's most formidable opposition figure, his grave disappearing under a vast mound of carnations and roses. We lost our hope, but now we came here and uh, together we Perhaps we can find it again. But Navalny's death in an Arctic prison camp has blown a huge hole in Russia's opposition. While the funeral showed there is still dissent in the country, it also underlined how much control the Kremlin has. This weekend, Russia will hold its presidential election that will crown Putin for a fifth term. Virtually all leading Russian opposition figures are either in jail or in exile, and resistance to Putin has never been more dangerous. Obviously, Alexei was at the heart of your movement. Is it possible to continue without him? Well, of course, we have no choice but to continue, and he was a like, never-give-up person. And uh if he would stop now it would be like a betrayal of his legacy he definitely wants us to continue and not to give up but he's not replaceable leonid volkov was navalny's right hand man from exile in europe he and navalny's team say they will continue to fight personal risks for everyone in the leadership of our movement are of course very high we we are well aware of these personal risks, but it's our choice to keep going. A week after we spoke, Volkov was attacked near his home in Lithuania. He says hit 15 times with a hammer and sprayed with tear gas. Laying flowers is also how they protest at another demonstration in Moscow. Each weekend for the past few months, wives of Russian soldiers drafted to fight in Ukraine gather here, beneath the walls of the Kremlin, at the memorial to the unknown soldier. They come to call for their husbands to be returned home. Only around two dozen attend. They are careful not to say they oppose the war, calling it by the Kremlin's name, the special military operation. They just say civilians should not serve indefinitely. 
а никакого отношения не было. Но специальная военная операция, она была, есть, существует, да? А, как бы ее не звали. Она просто есть. И ну, для моей семьи это трагедия, потому что у меня нет одного человека рядом. А в причинах и следствиях для разбирательных причин нет. Извините, не могу быть. The police are wary of detaining the women, but not of the journalists covering the demonstration, who are dragged off to vans. The Kremlin keen that even this small protest stay unnoticed. But those who are willing to risk demonstrating publicly in Russia are a tiny minority right now. There is no doubt around the outcome of this weekend's election. Putin changed the constitution in 2020 to allow him to run despite a two-term limit. Officials close to the Kremlin have suggested even holding elections is pointless. We could have had the election tomorrow or in five minutes the result would have been the same. He doesn't need a campaign. In the run-up to the election, something unexpected did happen. Few people had heard of Boris Nadezhdin three months ago. A long-time liberal politician, on state TV, he's been one of the only voices to criticize the war. In December, he announced he would run against Putin on an anti-war platform. Long lines suddenly began appearing of people waiting to sign up to support his candidacy. In effect, some of the largest anti-war protests since the full-scale invasion. I am sure that the majority of people in Russia want the special military operation be stopped as soon as possible. And of course, uh, the support of me is very big in Russia. ABC sat down with Nadezhdin before Navalny's death asking why he was able to challenge Putin. There is two big difference between me and, for example, uh, between me and Alexei Navalny. First, I never criticize Putin personally. I criticize the politics of Putin, but I never criticize Putin like a person, in a bad words, never. But in the end, Nadezhdin was kept off the ballot. Authorities claimed the signatures for his candidacy were invalid. It means Putin won't face any real challenger. Alexei Navalny's widow, Yulia Navalnaya, has still called for people to join a protest on election day, as her husband had before his death. Putin нарисует себе любой результат, который ему по душе. Хоть 80, хоть 180 процентов. Но мы все равно можем эти так называемые выборы использовать против него. Navalny's team have urged people simply to quietly come to polling stations at midday on Sunday and to vote for any candidate except Putin or spoil their votes. Anything more, they say, is now too dangerous. We don't expect that those votes will be counted. They will not. But people will come together will see each other in their precincts and will have this feeling that they actually exist. They are actually not a marginal minority as the propaganda pretends they are, but they are actually huge crowds. For those opposed to Putin in Russia, the goal right now just to show each other that they still exist. Our thanks to Patrick for that in-depth report. We still have much more to get to here on Prime. Coming up, what a new report is revealing about cannabis use in teens, particularly in states where it's legal. We're in Miami to check out a golf tournament that's loud, howdy, and controversial. We've got exclusive access. We are about to party. We're not from the country club. We love the game of golf. We're trying to have fun with it. Sports washing is a form of information manipulation. When you do something wrong as a political regime, you can't just get rid of the stain. Power 
play the booming business of sports washing. Now streaming on Hulu. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. You should see me in the Strongest females fight for the survival of their families. Oh, hey, the queens. You should see me in a crowd. Babe Ruth, Hank Aaron, Shoei Otani, legends of the game. But now the list of greats redefined. From ABC News, reclaim the forgotten league, a side of the story of baseball you have never heard before like this. The award-winning podcast is back. Listen wherever you get your podcasts or scan the QR codes you see here. Reporting from the nuclear-armed ballistic missile submarine, the USS Kentucky in South Korea, I'm Martha Raddatz. You're streaming ABC News Live. Next tonight to the launch of the largest rocket ever made and the stunning images coming in from the big SpaceX mission today, crossing several major hurdles, but then burning up on its way back to Earth. And the bigger question, how soon do they plan on putting astronauts on that rocket to the moon? Mireya Villarreal reports. Lifting off from the coast of South Texas today, SpaceX launching its third test flight of Starship, the biggest and most powerful rocket ever built. We are feeling the rumble. The spacecraft NASA hopes will one day help bring astronauts back to the moon. And passing supersonic, so we're now moving faster than the speed of sound. Starship traveling farther in space than ever before, almost halfway around the Earth. Oh, man, I need a moment to pick my jaw up from the floor because these views are just stunning. SpaceX expected Starship would survive re-entry to the atmosphere, but break apart when it hit the ocean. The heat shield tiles doing their work up to 2,600 degrees Fahrenheit, that those heat shield tiles are dissipating. Instead, the spacecraft lost contact and burned up on its way back to Earth. Wow, incredible images. It makes everything feels so tiny here on Earth. Our thanks to Mireya for that. We still have much more ahead here on Prime, the surprise onstage moment that had fans of a 90s boy band screaming, probably screeching too. And actress Regina King, she sits down for her first TV interview since her son's sudden death. She opens up about grief, love, and her son's legacy. Wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, from Poland once again tonight. Thank you so much for streaming with us. Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. Do you think you'll ever be able to go back home? We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Splintered houses and splintered lives. And the magnitude of the devastation. You're streaming ABC News Live. Reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi. Santa Fe, New Mexico. Raleigh, North Carolina. The U.S. Capitol. Mayfield, Kentucky. Minneapolis. Mexico. Tongass National Forest, Alaska. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. Giving you a front row seat to our world as it plays out in real time, live. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights, America's most honored streaming news program, only on ABC News Live. Streaming free right now, wherever you stream your news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today, escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about, the migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. 
This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes. And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. Start Here. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Make it your daily first listen wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. We have a breaking news update for this for those just joining us tonight. The father of mass shooter Ethan Crumley, James Crumley, was found guilty of involuntary manslaughter by a jury just a few minutes ago. James Crumley joining his wife Jennifer as the first parents in this country to be charged for the mass shooting committed by their son after a jury ruled he was guilty on four counts, one for each child killed in that Oxford High School shooting. The jury deliberated for 11 hours for two days to reach the verdict. The judge presiding has set the sentencing date for April 9th. Next to some of the other stories we're following tonight, a FedEx semi-trailer rolls over a bridge, the search for thieves who stole an unusual item, and a 90s boy band reunites on stage for the first time in years. Those stories in tonight's rundown. A close call for the driver of a FedEx truck in upstate New York. Look at this. A crash sent the truck dangling off an overpass on the I-90 in Pittsburgh. Five people were treated for injuries, including an infant, but thankfully all appeared to be minor. An investigation now underway into the cause of the crash. Two liquid asphalt tanks and a motor oil tank caught fire at a quarry in Rockville, Maryland, causing a heavy smoke plume that could be seen for miles. According to the local fire authority, around 75 firefighters were at the scene and it is still unclear what started the blaze. No injuries were reported. An American Airlines Boeing 777 traveling from Dallas to Los Angeles forced to make an emergency landing after reports of mechanical problems. This video capturing the moment the plane carrying 249 people touched down at LAX airport with a possible flat tire. This comes on the heels of several other incidents on Boeing planes in recent days as the company promises to change its safety procedures at its manufacturing plants, including added layers of inspection. A survey of high school seniors found that about 11% admitted to using Delta-8 THC. That's a compound related to the psychoactive chemical found in marijuana. It also noted that almost a third of high school seniors in that survey reported using marijuana in the past year. Scientists believe this underestimates how many high school seniors are using these drugs, which can be found in gummies, edibles, or other forms. It also found that THC use among students in that grade is disproportionately concentrated in the South and Midwest regions of the U.S. and in states where marijuana use is not legal. Meghan Markle, the Duchess of Sussex, returned to Instagram to tease a new brand. People Magazine reports that a trademark application for American Riviera Orchard says it could include jams, household items, cutlery, and cookbooks. The newly created Instagram page features a link to a website and the brand's logo, which includes Montecito, the name of the California neighborhood where she and Prince Harry now reside. 
In nearly 30 years after their first performance together, NSYNC is back. The boy band reuniting overnight at the pre-release party for Justin Timberlake's new album. JT, Joey Fatone, Lance Bass, Chris Kirkpatrick, and JC Chazé performing Bye Bye Bye, It's Gonna Be Me, and their new collab, Paradise. It's the first time that all five of them have performed together since 2013. Justin's new album drops on Friday. Actress Regina King is marking her return to the screen and to the public with her role in the new film, Shirley, about Congresswoman Shirley Chisholm's historic run for president. It comes two years after the sudden death of her beloved son, Ian. In her first TV interview since the tragedy, she speaks to Good Morning America's Robin Roberts about her son's legacy and her grief journey. For nearly 40 years, she's reigned as one of Hollywood's most versatile talents. That plane does not take off unless we're both on it. Got it. From her breakout role in the 80s sitcom 227. Are you crazy? <laughs> to her Oscar-winning performance in If Beale Street Could Talk. Do you think I came here to make you suffer? Regina King is known for humanizing complex characters. If I can't get the nomination, I can still get delegates including her latest role starring in the biopic, Shirley. How did you prepare to play Shirley Chisholm? It's been a 15-year journey since we were going to tell Shirley's story to now it actually happening. And I think 15 years ago, I wasn't ready to play Shirley. I may have thought that I was then, but I wasn't ready. I needed to live more life. <laughs> Regina's joined by her sister, yeah, Raina, who co-produces yeah. and plays a key role in the film that chronicles Shirley Chisholm's political rise in 1972 as she becomes the first black woman to run for president. We felt like there were so many people who did not know who Shirley Chisholm is, who she was, who she is, mm -hmm. and that bugged us. When you're a first, when, when you set out to do something that no one else has done before, there's no example of that for you. That's a lonely road to travel. Yeah, mm -hmm. and it just so happens to be an election year. Yeah. We were like, no, it needs to live and be in the space now um, so that if it's going to inspire anyone, especially young people, to be involved yeah. with the political process, then we've done something right. And we've also honored Shirley, and we've, um, we've followed through with what Shirley is, has unbought and unbossed. For the last couple of years, Regina has been taking much needed time away. In January of 2022, her dear son Ian tragically passing away by suicide. You dedicated the film to your beloved yeah, Ian, your to son. My Ian. What has this time span, these last two years, been like for you, Regina? Oh, wow. Um, you know, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a different person, you know, uh, now than I was um, January 19th. Um, I am, grief is, is, is a journey, you know. I, I understand that um, grief is love that has no place to go. I know that it's important to me to honor Ian in the totality of, of who he is. I speak about him in the present because he is always with me and the joy and happiness that he gave all of us. But behind that joy and happiness, Ian's mental health took a toll. When it comes to um, depression, that people expect it to look a certain way and they expect it to look heavy, and um, people expect that um, it's okay. to have to experience this and not be able to um, have the um, time to just sit with 
Ian's choice, which I respect and understand, you know, that he didn't want to be here anymore. And that's a, um, a hard thing for other people to uh, receive because they did not live um, our experience, um, did not live Ian's journey. I think a lot of people, a lot of people are going to appreciate that you said it was his choice and that you recognize that. I was so angry with God, you know, that why would, why would that weight be given to Ian? You know, of all of the things that we had gone through with the therapy, psych, psych, with psychiatrists and programs and and he just Ian was like I'm tired of talking mom my favorite thing about myself is being Ian's mom mm. and I can't say that with a smile with tears with all of the emotion that comes with that I can't do that um, if I did not um, respect the journey their close bond always on full display at Regina's red carpet events. I, I thought about him when you were on the stage at the Oscars because you were wearing orange. That's his favorite color. Yes. I remember he used to escort you. Yeah. To, yeah. So are there moments where he was always there with you physically that, not, not does it trigger, but is it? Oh, it's a trigger. Is it? Absolutely, absolutely. So sometimes it'll trigger um, just laughter most times, um, as of recent, it, it triggers a smile, um, but sometimes um, the absence, his absence, is really loud. Mm -hmm. Regina admits she still struggles with acceptance. Sometimes, you know, it's a lot of guilt um, comes over me. When a parent loses a child, you still wonder, what could I have done to, so that wouldn't have happened? I know that I share this grief with um, everyone, but no one else is Ian's mom, you know? Mm -mm. Only me. And so um, it's mine. And the, the sadness uh, will never go away. It'll always be with me. And I think I saw um, somewhere uh, s the sadness is a reminder of how much he means to me, you know? Happy sorrow is what my mother used yeah, to call happy it. happy sorrow. Yeah. You said um, something that Shirley Chisholm, what are the two words, unbought and unbossed? So what are two words for your motto to get? What, what would be your two words? Hmm. I don't know that I can, two words. I have two words for you. Do you? Ian's mom. That's the first thought that came to my mind. I know you. That's the first thought that came you. to my mind, but I was like, okay, let me come up with something more profound. Let <laughs> no. me, that's what I was trying to, but that I, was the first thought it. that came to my mind. That's all right. Ian's mom. Robin Roberts, thank you for that conversation with Ian's mom. That is our show for this hour. I'm Stephanie Ramos. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, tracking a dangerous cross-country storm as it heads toward the Northeast. And the countries coming together for joint military drills as tensions escalate in multiple regions. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming.
wherever you get your podcasts. Start here. It's lunchtime in America, so what are we serving up? Well, how about everything you need to know? You know, that sounds pretty good. Give it to me. Your health, your money, breaking news, pop culture, with the biggest stars, music, trends, and of course, good food. GMA 3, what you need to know. A third hour of GMA in the afternoon. So join us, afternoons. For everything you need to know. I love Give that. It to me. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Real Housewives of Beverly Hills star, Erica Jane, celebrity attorney, Tom Girardi. This story was a nuclear explosion. Today, several victims will get a chance to finally meet Erica Girardi. I'm at sort of a loss for what to say. Did you see the documentary? Yeah. The Housewife and the Hustler? I did. I wanted Erica to say, I'm sorry, face to face. Erica, why did it take you so long? The Housewife and the Hustler 2, only on Hulu. You should see me. The strongest females fight for the survival of their families. Oh, hey, the queens. You should see me in a crowd. Whenever, wherever news breaks, it's so important to always remember that lives are changed. Here in London, in Buffalo, Uvalde, Texas, Edinburgh, Scotland, reporting from Rolling Fork, Mississippi, Ukrainian refugees here in Warsaw. We're heading to a small community outside of Mexico City. Getting you behind the stories as they happen. ABC News Live Prime. We'll take you there. Stream ABC News Live weeknights wherever you stream your news. Only on ABC News Live. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome to ABC News Live Prime. I'm Stephanie Ramos in for Lindsay Davis. We come to you tonight with breaking news. A Michigan jury just a short time ago finding father Jason Crumley guilty of four counts of involuntary manslaughter one for each of the students his son murdered at his high school back in 2021. The jury of 12 deliberating for about 11 hours over two days before reaching their verdict. And that's roughly the same amount of time a jury needed to convict Ethan Crumley's mother, Jennifer Crumley, last month. Trevor Alt is joining us now with that story. Tonight, a Michigan jury finding James Crumbly guilty of four Man counts of involuntary manslaughter. Guilty of involuntary manslaughter. One for each of the students his son murdered at Oxford High School in 2021. Last month, his wife Jennifer convicted on the same charges the first parent held criminally responsible in their child school shooting. In James's trial, prosecutors allege he was negligent, ignoring signs of his son's deteriorating mental health and buying him the gun used in the shooting. James Crumbly was presented with the easiest, most glaring opportunities to prevent the deaths of these four students, and he did nothing. Hours before the shooting, James and his wife met with their son's counselor over concerning drawings, but they declined to take their son home from school. James did not take the stand in his own defense, but his wife testified during her trial that it was her husband's responsibility to keep the family gun secure. It was more his thing, so I let him handle that. The defense argues James had no way of knowing what his son was planning. James Crumbly had no idea what his son was capable of. I'm joined by ABC's Trevor Alt, as well as ABC News legal contributor and defense attorney Brian Buckmeyer. Trevor, I'll start with you. You were at the school the day of the shooting with, with prosecutors when these charges were filed, and you've been in court for both trials. Uh, this is a big deal. What do you make of this verdict? Yeah, I mean, uh, it's 
Hard to say that it's stunning when his wife was already convicted, but it's still unbelievable and unprecedented to watch parents be convicted for their role in their child's school shooting. And as those verdicts are read, I cannot help but think of, so just to the left of the camera that's filming all this video, Stephanie, every single day in court are the family members of the four students who were killed in this shooting. It's been more than two years since that shooting happened, and every day in court, for Jennifer Crumbly's trial, for James Crumbly's trial, the parents of those victims sat there, they waited patiently, and they said that they just wanted justice and accountability. Now that they have four guilty verdicts for both parents, they made it clear every time, this isn't about some set punishment, there isn't some set uh, prison sentence that they want. They more want the fact that it's on the record and now for the first time, we have these two parents on the record in a case in which prosecutors said from the beginning was so egregious, ignoring all of those red flags, buying the weapon for the shooter, refusing to take their child home from school just hours before. Uh, and now it's a new day in how these prosecutors might respond to mass shootings. A very unique circumstance. Yeah. Uh, Brian, I want to bring you in from a legal standpoint. What's your reaction to the jury finding uh, him guilty on all four counts of involuntary manslaughter and the potential sentencing for that? Yeah. Well, Stephanie, like Trevor said, it wasn't too surprising considering we've seen this verdict already from Jennifer Crumbly. Uh, but it is interesting that we now have two parents who are found guilty of a type of liability that we don't really see in the criminal justice system. It's called vicarious liability. Most people understand it as uh, an employer can be on the hook for what an employee does. Now we're having that same concept used for parent to child. And when we look at the sentence, each one of them being involuntary manslaughter for one to 15 years, uh, they, they could be si serving significant jail time. However, my understanding of Michigan law is that because of the level of felony that involuntary manslaughter is, the maximum they can get is 30 years. So somewhere between two and 30 years, they could be potentially facing a sentence. And Trevor, as we were watching the verdict come down, we, we saw James Crumley there in the courtroom. He was kind of shaking his head. Where do things go from here for the Crumleys? Yeah, so step one uh, pretty soon, Stephanie, is going to be the sentencing. It's set for April 9th. It had already been set for April 9th for Jennifer Crumley. They were waiting until this trial had finished. And now today, James Crumley is going to be receiving his sentence the same day. So April 9th is when we find out how long they will end up spending in prison. They've already spent more than two years in jail. And according to Jennifer, they have not spoken since then. But also, uh, looming in the background of all of this, while it's not a criminal trial, the families of the victims had fi have filed some pretty gigantic lawsuits against the school. And in the process of James and Jennifer Crumbly going on trial, school officials who met with this student, who met with the parents the day of the shooting, did testify that they also did not consider this child to be a threat to other students, that they failed to search his backpack even though he had drawn on his math homework a gun with a person shot. He wrote blood everywhere, the thoughts won't stop, help me. They knew it was serious enough to call the Crumbleys into the school, but they didn't conduct the search, which they would have had the right to do had they so chosen. So it's possible, while they might not be held criminally liable for the shooting, Stephanie, they could be held uh, civilly liable, and there's a pretty multi, there's a multi-million dollar lawsuit that's still hanging in the balance here against the schools. Something else to watch, and, and Brian, the Crumleys are the first parents to ever be charged. Trevor touched on this earlier. What could this mean for future mass shooting cases? Well, prosecutors across the country now have a blueprint as to how they can find uh, parents potentially responsible for the deaths of victims to mass shootings. Now, for Michigan, one of their involuntary manslaughters were very unique to their own law, being that a parent has a duty to, to protect other people from their child. Maybe we could potentially see legislation in other states um, stemming from that idea as well. But at this point, where we have a country where uh, the unfortunate reality is we can't recover from one uh, mass shooting before the next one happens, prosecutors can be looking to this case and say, maybe this could be a solution going forward. Yeah, and, and, and Trevor, you mentioned the, the parents of, of those teens that lost their lives in that courtroom day in and day out. So heartbreaking for them. But as you said, hopefully they can find some sort of hope and resolve in the justice that they saw here tonight. Yeah. Trevor Alt, thank you so much. Brian Buckmeyer, thank you to you as well. Next tonight to that major snowstorm in Colorado, tornado watches from Texas to Ohio, and tonight this system is headed east. The system dumping up to three feet of snow and near hurricane strength winds in the mountains. Multiple ski areas shut down today, and Colorado could see up to a foot more of snow tonight. And on the warm side of that front, the severe weather concern and tornado risk. Ginger Z will have the forecast in just a moment, but first, Mola Lange is reporting from Denver. 
Tonight, vehicles sliding, stalling, and stranded from a massive weather system dumping feet of late season snow in the Rockies. This is a sight we've been seeing all day. Drivers spinning out, getting stuck, needing help from Colorado Department of Transportation folks, getting towed out, getting pushed, whatever it takes. Roads out here are treacherous and will only get worse before they get better. Outside Denver, multiple stretches of Interstate 70 shut down, the crucial highway turning into a travel nightmare. Tractor trailers spinning their wheels, drivers getting out to push their cars. Charlie Stubblefield and his team from Mountain Recovery trying to clear the interstate. We are stuck with three feet of snow probably. Look at the top of that semi right now. Uh, vehicles that have been stranded out here for a good 17 hours. Denver's public schools closed. More than 800 flights in and out of Denver's airport canceled. The extreme conditions forcing multiple ski resorts to close down. It's right there. That's it. Meanwhile, in the heartland, a severe weather outbreak is unfolding. With 35 million Americans under threat from Texas to Ohio. A suspected tornado touching down in Milton, Kentucky this afternoon. Two people were hurt. We have multiple trees down, probably 50 to 100 houses that have some kind of damage. AccuWeather storm chasers catching this massive twister as it tore across farmland west of Topeka, Kansas overnight. Those storms dumping up to softball-sized hail. And Mola Lange joins us now. Mola, I imagine it'll be a long night ahead for those folks dealing with all the snow. Yeah, winter weather watch continues into Friday morning. Stephanie, uh, it is still snowing as we speak. As you can see by this down tree, there is still a lot to clean up throughout the area. And even once it stops snowing, travel and the roads are expected to remain dicey throughout the Denver metro area, Steph. All right, Mola Lange there in Denver for us. Thank you so much. Please stay safe. Now let's get to the forecast to see what happens next. ABC's chief meteorologist Ginger Z is timing it all out for us. Hey there, Ginger. Hey, Stephanie, so here we are. It was in the mid 70s ahead of all the storms in the middle of the nation. You know something is big when Denver and everyone's getting all that snow. So that big temperature gradient kicked off more tornadoes today and we've got tornado watches at this moment all the way from Toledo back to Texarkana and Dallas just got in a severe thunderstorm watch. That's going to be all the way through the overnight hours. We know that nocturnal tornadoes can be really dangerous. So watch that have two ways to get warnings if you're anywhere highlighted there. Then I want to take you to the snow side of this because Denver and the surrounding area not done yet. An additional 6 to 12 inches is possible and it'll be gusty winds coming along with that. Southern Rockies will get some too and we're going to break up this warm weather party with a few showers. Stephanie. Thanks for watching it all for us, Ginger. Donald Trump's hush money case in New York is set to begin in just over a week. But the Manhattan District Attorney is moving to delay it a month. It comes a day after the U.S. Attorney's Office turned over 31,000 pages of new documents. That would put all four criminal cases brought against Trump on hold with no certain start dates. Here's ABC's senior investigative correspondent, Aaron Katursky. <laughs> Donald Trump arriving at a Florida court, his lawyers trying to convince a federal judge the special counsel's case over his handling of classified documents should be dismissed. Trump's team arguing the charges were unconstitutionally vague. But Judge Aileen Cannon, who Trump appointed to the bench, ruling tonight she will not dismiss the case on those grounds. She's still considering another motion to dismiss, but after a full day of arguments, Cannon strongly signaling she is inclined to let the case move forward, saying your arguments might have some force but it's difficult to see how this leads to a dismissal of the indictment. Are you prepared to go to trial on March 25th? Her ruling coming just hours after a surprise announcement in New York. The Manhattan District Attorney, Alvin Bragg, proposing a one-month delay on the start of Trump's hush money trial. Stormy, do you feel Trump's accused of trying to conceal payments to adult film star Stormy Daniels. The first of the former president's criminal trials was supposed to get underway less than two weeks from now. Prosecutors said they just got their hands on tens of thousands of pages and documents from the Justice Department. And they want to give Trump's legal team up to 30 days to review them. Prosecutors noting there will be another production of documents by next week. Mr. Cohen, what did the committee want to know? The records you? are related to Trump's former fixer, Michael Cohen, who wrote the check to Stormy Daniels. Trump has pleaded not guilty. His legal team demanding months to go over the new records, which would delay the trial even more. Our thanks to Aaron Katursky. 
Terrifying moments here in New York City during a shooting at a subway station, sending riders ducking for cover. Officials say a man was shot in the head. It happened just days after the National Guard was sent into the subway. ABC's Ariel Reshev has these details. Hey there, Stephanie. Well, we are just getting harrowing video into our newsroom. I want to take you straight to that. You can see subway riders ducking for cover and screaming in horror moments after a man was shot in the head inside the station in downtown Brooklyn shortly before 5 p.m. Of course, just as rush hour is kicking off here in the city, the victim seen here on a stretcher rushed to the hospital in critical condition. Police sources say that a suspect is in custody and a weapon has been recovered from the scene. But as you mentioned, Stephanie, this is days after Governor Hochul ordered the National Guard into the city's subway stations to patrol amid a 13% spike just so far this year in subway crime. Steph? So, so frightening. Thank you so much, Ariel. Next tonight, Vice President Kamala Harris and the historic visit to a Planned Parenthood clinic in Minneapolis. The first time a president or vice president has been to a women's health clinic that offers abortion. The president, his campaign, and Democrats are trying to keep the focus on the overturning of Roe. Rachel Scott reports. Tonight, Kamala Harris making history as the first vice president to visit a women's health clinic where abortions are provided a sign of just how central this issue has become to the Biden campaign. And walking through this clinic, that's what I saw, are people who have dedicated their lives to the profession of providing health care in a safe place that gives people dignity. And I think we should all want that for each other. 21 states have banned or restricted access to abortion since the Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade. The Minnesota Planned Parenthood Clinic Harris visited says they've seen a nearly 100% increase in patients coming in from other parts of the country. How dare these elected leaders believe they are in a better position to tell women what they need, to tell women what is in their best interest. We have to be a nation that trusts women. Democrats keenly aware voters have moved to protect abortion rights in all six states where it has appeared on the ballot since Roe versus Wade was overturned, including conservative states like Kansas, Kentucky, and Ohio. In his State of the Union speech, President Biden noting that in the Supreme Court's decision overturning Roe, the justices themselves wrote, women are not without political power. You're about to realize just how much you get right about that. The president is counting on abortion to drive voters to the polls this November. As many as 14 states could have measures related to abortion or reproductive rights on the ballot, among them Nevada, Pennsylvania, and Arizona, battleground states that could decide this election. Our thanks to Rachel Scott. We still have much more to get to here on Prime. Coming up, why a new court ruling could be a game changer for LGBTQ plus people living in Japan. Whenever news breaks. We are here in Israel, a nation at war after that brutal surprise attack by Hamas. On the ground in Ukraine, reporting from Lewiston, Maine. The scene of a horrific mass shooting. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. In rolling fork, this tornado tore through this little town. From the most devastating disaster in Hawaii. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. In Iceland. Let's go. Yeah. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. From the front lines. From southern Israel. Outside the Gaza Strip. In Beirut. From the FBI. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of the 
part of an operation. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not a pair, ain't it? How important it made the USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's my own. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Reporting from the war in Ukraine, I'm Ian Panel. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. We're tracking several headlines around the world. Gay rights supporters rejoiced in Japan today after a top appeals court decided that a ban on same-sex marriage was unconstitutional because it violates Japan's guaranteed right to have a family. It was the first ruling of its kind in Japan, which remains the only G7 nation without legal protection for same-sex unions. The United States and South Korea, along with service members from 11 other countries, just completed 11 days of live fire exercises on the Korean Peninsula. More than 20 South Korean tanks fired hundreds of rounds based on intelligence provided by U.S. drones. The exercises, known as Freedom Shields, are meant to deter North Korean aggression. North Korea condemned them, calling it a practice for invasion. And as not to appear outmatched, Russia, Iran, and China simultaneously held their own naval exercises near the Gulf of Oman. More than 20 warships were involved there. And still to come, 21 seasons later, and Top Chef is still going strong. But now with a new host and a new location. Host Kristen Kish and Judge Gail Simmons join us to talk about the upcoming season. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming. Wherever you get your podcasts, start here. We're in Miami to check out a golf tournament that's loud, howdy, and controversial. We've got exclusive access. We are about to party. We're not from the country club. We love the game of golf. We're trying to have fun with it. Sports washing is a form of information manipulation. When you do something wrong as a political regime, you can't just get rid of the stain. Power play, the booming business of sports washing. Now streaming on Hulu. The strongest females fight for the survival of their families. Oh, hey, the queens. You should see me in the crowd. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. Is this our combat operations center? We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag. Not a pair, ain't it? How important it made the USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. It's my own. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know who you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Talk about longevity. Top Chef is set to premiere its 21st season with lots of changes. There's a new host and the show's primary location this season, Wisconsin. Take a look. We've gathered rising star chefs from across the country. Here to Wisconsin. I need dairy. Wisconsin! There's something Wisconsinites can't live without. Cheese! Cheese Fest 2023. Too much cheese. <laughs> is there ever too much cheese, though? <laughs> I Never. don't know about that. <laughs> Joining us now is the show's host, Kristen Kish, and longtime judge, Gail Simmons. Thank you both so much for speaking with us. What's the what's like the secret sauce? I mean, 21 seasons, Gail. Like, what keeps this show running? I, I mean, in some ways, your guess is as good as mine. I'll tell you this. <laughs> when we did season one, yeah. in we shot at the end of 2005. It aired in 2006. In a million years, I never thought I'd be sitting here 21 seasons later. It really has been an incredible journey for everyone involved, and none of us really saw it coming. We thought we were onto a good thing, but I think there's a couple 
pieces of the show that keep it fresh and keep it going. One is exactly what you said. This season we're in Wisconsin. Who to thunk it? Every season we change locations. It's part of the fabric of the show because we get to explore a different culture, a different food way, you know, uh, the story of a different place all through the lens of food. And then the other piece is the contestants themselves, the quality of the chefs who are on the show. This is not a show for amateurs, right? These are professionals at the height of their careers. They are extraordinary people who are sort of on the precipice of greatness. And we just sort of push them over the edge. Mm -hmm. And creating amazing dishes, mm -hmm. too. Kristen, as the host, you was it hard to tell these contestants, the losing contestants, oh. pack up your knives, you gotta go? Like, what was that like? You know, every time, so like you you kind of get a cue when you're when you're allowed to say it or they're ready for you to say it, the cameras are set. And every time it'd be like, Kristen, go ahead. And I would take a I would take a beat and a pause, and they'd be like, Did you hear us? You can you can go. And I said, I know, but I just I know what it feels like to hear it. And I know what it feels like to have to walk away from the competition. And it's just, it's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. um, but th there's a lot of opportunity, no matter if you're sent home first or you make it all the way to the end, it's a great thing for your career. Yeah. So why is the season in Wisconsin? No, no, nothing against Wisconsin. I love a good cheese curd, mm -hmm. but why Wisconsin? We've been abroad all over the world, from Singapore to Mexico to London and Paris. and. We have actually never really explored the heartland of America um, and the Midwest. Specifically, we were in Chicago season four 15 years ago, but Chicago in itself isn't indicative of the rest of that part of the country. And it was actually really refreshing. They welcomed us so warmly. So beyond judging the dishes, how do you both see your role as a mentor guiding the chefs through such a high pressure environment? You know, I think one thing that you don't get to see in its totality when you watch an episode of the show, and, and Tom talks a lot, a lot about this with us, we have six to eight cameras shooting 14 hours a day, every day when we're, when we're on location. It takes two to three days to shoot one episode, so you can do the math, and that is boiled down to 46 minutes. Or this year, actually, every episode is supersized, so let's say it, it boils down to a little over an hour. But that is an enormous amount of content that's left on the cutting room floor. Of course, that's the that's television. Mm -hmm. But what you don't get to see, I think, is the the depth of the conversations that we have with these chefs. And it looks like we make very quick decisions and that those decisions are relatively easy. They are not. We are never judging terrible food against great food. It is all pretty great at this point. And so I think what we're looking for um, is really to challenge people who we know are capable of rising to these challenges. With with you all sampling so many different dishes from, from all of the different contestants, is it ever overwhelming to have so much food to try at once? <laughs> Yes. <laughs> it is overwhelming. Does it get a little gross, even though these are like top notch um, meals? Don't always eat everything on yes, every plate. That's the thing. I think yeah. people have this conception that we're plowing through 17 plates of food in one sitting. We, we taste every plate. Okay. We have a few bites. You have to learn to taste and understand the dish without having to finish every plate. You would never survive. Well, thank you both so much for joining me this evening. I'm still looking forward to this new season of Top Chef. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you so much. Gail Simmons and Kristen Kish, lovely to have you. And you can tune into Top Chef season 21, premiering Wednesday, March 20th at 9 p.m. on Bravo. The episodes will then be available to stream on Peacock the very next day. That is our show for tonight. I'm Stephanie Ramos. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news context and analysis. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, Pluto TV, the ABC News app, and of course, on abcnews.com. here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live America's number one streaming news. Why do so many people start their day here? From ABC News, this is Start Here. To be in the know and get a different take on the day's top stories. A lot of news today, so let's get into it. Listen now to the Daily News Podcast honored with four Edward R. Murrow Awards and see why the New York Times calls it a news podcast worth listening to. Start Here, ABC News. Make it your daily first listen. Now, that's a part of the story I bet you didn't see coming.
wherever you get your podcasts. Start here. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Yet another avalanche warning that's up. To catch you up with what happened overnight. A dangerous ice storm is impacting the morning commute. What's happening today? Escalating tensions in the Middle East. What people are talking about. The migrant crisis. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. How does billionaire sound? Sounds good to me. The moose started chasing a dog. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. Real Housewives of Beverly Hills star Erica Jane, celebrity attorney Tom Girardi. This story was a nuclear explosion. Today, several victims will get a chance to finally meet Erica Girardi. I'm at sort of a loss for what to say. Did you see the documentary, yeah. The Housewife and the Hustler? I did. I wanted Erica to say, I'm sorry, face to face. Erica, why did it take you so long? The Housewife and the Hustler 2, only on Hulu. What does it take to be the most watched newscast in America? We are part of an operation. Is this our combat operation center? We're approaching the gate. Militants came in from different directions. Nuclear reactor. So you have a couple loaded and ready to go. The house is destroyed, but the flag is not a carry in it. How important it made the USA. Great work. Hi. Appreciate you. Thank you. Ismael. David. David. I'm David Muir. I know you are. You I do. Watch you every night. ABC's World News Tonight with David Muir is America's most watched newscast. Reporting from the Iowa caucuses, I'm Wade Johnson. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. This is Nightline. Former child actor Drake Bell and other Nickelodeon stars coming forward and sharing details about what they say was the dark side of life behind the scenes of the juggernaut network and hitmaker. Here's ABC's Eva Pilgrim. Drake Bell coming out.